Sheikha Bacon. Hi, Bacon. Hi, Hi Bacon. Hi. What's you up? Bacon Bean? Oh. Um, not, not, <laughs> not much. What's up with you? Oh, you know, nothing. Just chilling. Doing a podcast with my bestie. Oh, that's fun. That sounds like yeah. a good time. Great. Yeah, no. Um, no, Anything I'm noteworthy? good. I had, a, I had a pretty good week. I had a lot of client sessions. I just feel like I was in here doing a lot of doing a lot of mediations. You lately. are doing a lot of mediations lately. I yeah. too have noticed. Yeah. Maybe something- we should do yeah. an episode about it. Definitely. There must be something in the air. A little conflict in the yeah. air. Yeah. People are a little conflicted with each other and themselves, I feel like. I feel mm, good. Deep. But maybe that's what having, it is. Yeah. Yeah. They're having a moment. Internal well, do you uh, what do you have do you, to delight you, me with or cringe no, me with? What do you have? Oh, all right. Oh. I'll, I was going to give my delight, which is I just spilled water all over my paper. Oh. Is that that was not my delight. My delight was I had hernia surgery several weeks ago and was not able to work out. This sounds very obnoxious. I wasn't able to work out and I finally was clear to work out and I worked out yes. this morning. And then you forget like how I felt fine not working out. A little blah and gross, but not too bad. But then you forget when you do work out, you're like, oh my God. Endorphins. Feels what? good, right? Yeah. yeah I'm like you're an like animal. I'm, yeah. I'm unstoppable. Yeah. I'm like on the bike listening to Beyonce. I'm like, nobody could take me on right now. Fight me. Fight I'm like me, going, B. Yeah, I'm like going faster. Yeah. Wow, exactly. I love this for you. Your energy feels like that. Oh, it does? I was yeah. Thinking- my energy didn't reflect that. In fact, our oh, producer no. asked me very kindly <laughs> right before we started, hey, have you just been crying recently? Because you And I said, no, why? And she said, because you look like it. Aw, <laughs> you don't look like it. It's like, no, actually, I've been working out to Beyonce. Thank you very much. Hey, did you know that if your eyes are puffy, makeup artists use Preparation H to take the puff that. down? I didn't know that. I've never tried it. I'm a little curious, but it feels dangerous, eh? Because it goes hey, near your... Why was I just your, Canadian? Hey, Because it goes hey. near your, your butt? Your butt? Is that why? No. It's dangerous to put it near your eye. Right. It, is your concern oh, because, because it's a butt it's cream? Med, yeah, it's made, in, intended for your behind. I don't know. I just feel like it's medicated. I wasn't I'll really thinking about the behind. I'll try it. Okay. I'll All try right, anything. You try it and report back next week. <laughs> we'll see if the producer well, thinks I look nicer. I have a cringe. No. I'm wearing... What? I want. I thought you were going to have a great delight. You want me to share my delight? Well, I think you had a really okay. delightful week last week. I and, had a, yeah. Go ahead. And I would also like to hear your cringe. Can we do a dual, a dual cringe delight? No, moment? I'll just Sorry. have to save my cringe for next week. Hi. I did have a delightful week yesterday. I mean, yesterday, last week. I got to be at Sundance with oh. my amazing friends amazing. and clients and um i was there to support the short film alok a-l-o-k about my incredible friend um who i coach alok um who's a non-binary performer author visionary poet just multi-talent yeah can't even describe them um in a few words and they were the subject of a a short film that my good friend Alex directed. It was her directorial debut in film and she made it to Sundance on her first go. Am uh, I allowed to say that I watched it? Is it? Yes, released? of course. Oh, I watched it and it was amazing and it was so yeah. well done and they captured, I thought, the essence of Alok in a very short period of time, which is challenging to do. Capture yes. any essence in a short period of time. Yes, totally. It was so good and it was such a fun Thing to be a part of. I got to be in it for a minute and talk yeah, about did. coaching Alok and that was amazing and watching the film on the big screen and being with this group of people and just celebrating them and it yeah. was a it's dream. Like a dream. <laughs> yeah. Oh. Yes. oh. Wow. Yeah. yeah. It's that nothing was my short delight. Of that. Uh, yeah. I didn't, that is delightful. <laughs> it was. It was. All right. Well, speaking of delightful, what do we got del- this week? Well, we've got money, which I find to be pretty topical for us because, well, more me. I feel like I've mentioned several times on this pod that I'm on this, well, I'm attempting this journey of financial independence and I'm curious and I'm very, I lack a lot of knowledge I'm learning Mm. Um, and I want to know more. So we decided, plus I feel like everybody has some feeling about money, good, bad, everybody. 
What does financial independence like mean to you? <sighs> financial independence is me being able to support myself, my lifestyle, and my children without the assistance of anyone else. Not to say that mm. I wouldn't keep the assistance of other people, but to be right. able to support myself. I think I've said it a bunch before. I've got, I went basically from my parents taking care of me my entire life. And then I met my yeah. husband pretty young, still in college. Um, yep. and my parents were actually still supporting me at that point. I'm very yep. benefit. I know I'm, I'm very lucky FYI. Um, and then I met my husband and he sort of started supporting me shortly after that. And I've never really had the funding of my own to take care of myself and support myself. And not have any guilt associated with any money that comes my way. Yeah. And I have such a opposite story because totally. of my mom um, struggling as a single mother financially, but also because I think of the way that things ended up with my dad, her constantly saying to me ever since I was little, do not rely on a man for money, which do not rely on anyone for money is what I took. Right. And so I took that really seriously. So I'm curious. What does it feel like? Like, when did you hit that moment of, oh, shit, this doesn't feel good? Like, what does it feel like to feel this? I was relying on my parents. Now it's my husband. What's the feeling or the emotion? Truthfully, I'm going to say something that sounds very naive, but for a long time, it was of no consequence to me. I, it was just, it was mm -hmm. basically all I knew. I, you know, I was lucky to grow up with a decent amount of wealth in my family. And then, to move to my husband, who was pretty quickly was making decent money as well. And um, it, it really wasn't on my radar that much. I, I, want to, I always wanted to stay home with my kids and raise my kids. Um, and I was lucky enough to do that. And then I think as I'm entering this phase of life where my kids are now out and I started to be like, wait, what am I doing? And really looking at my options and realizing, wow, unless I go back to school or I like hit it big, I feel like there's no way for me to achieve what I what I'm looking to achieve at this point. However, I'm trying to get myself mm. out of that mindset and back into a healthier mindset. And I'm really hoping this episode sparks something in me. Yeah. Well, so I mean, we talking. wanted to talk. Okay. <laughs> we wanted to talk about it because, you know, I was saying that money trauma is a real thing. Yes. That there are so many of us millions of us in the world um, experiencing currently or having experienced in the past trauma related to money and what that does to your belief systems about yes. yourself and about money. So when we talk about money, the reason I set up top in the intro, we're going to talk about wealth mindset is because that's a, I think, popular term right now in the culture around manifesting money and, and being in the wealth mindset. And if you Google it, you'll find like 500 alpha male Fortune 500 articles about how right. to do it. But I want to talk about it in a more organic way and also just have an honest conversation about like, what is money trauma and how does it block you? And money trauma, I would like to say, I believe can come from either direction. I mean, I feel like this isn't, I'm not saying I had trauma because I was taken care of, but I'm, I will say it hit me like a, what do you, a bag of bricks when I realized like a ton of oh, bricks, a ton of bricks, yeah, <laughs> bag of bricks. Uh, I was the one with the janky oh saying. God, sorry. I'm rubbing uh, off on you. Mm. What did I say last time? Bag of beans. That's what I said. I didn't even I don't even know where that came from. You don't from. remember. I, you're Dory. I remember, okay. but I don't even oh, know remember. where that came from. I don't either. It hit me like a ton of bricks, like holy moly. I I never even really wrapped my head around the fact that I've never been financially independent, I feel like until recently. And I think it's a little, if I, can I say this? Oh. I, am I taking vault stuff out to the public? It's a little terrifying for you, I think, to a feel. Li a little terrifying? Right. That's what I was asking you about the feeling is like, oh. it's scary. It's, it's beyond scary. It's like, if something happened to my husband tomorrow, I would, I don't even, like, I wouldn't even know where to start. Like, I wouldn't it's even know where to begin. It's not just if something happens to him. It's like, right, you're for right. me at least, See? it's like yes. when you're like just not aligned on the same page or you know how marriages are, there's months where you're like, oh, I don't even know 
Are yeah. You, like, and when you're in that space with someone who you're reliant on financially, it almost feels like it precludes you from actually checking in with your needs Agreed. because the largest need is your safety. So it's like, I don't, I'm going to have to ignore these other emotional needs or whatever Yeah, I in service it, of this financial safety. Yeah. I think financial safety in a lot of ways, while again, I'm very blessed to have it can be like um, shackles, like you right. said. Like, right. who knows what I could be doing if I shift my mindset? That's all I'd like to say. And I'm really working on it, but I am extremely stuck. You're No, you're not. You're making leaps and bounds. I am? Uh, I, honestly, yes. From the time that this realization came to you, I would say like four years ago to today, you are in a totally different headspace. Yes, that I can agree, which I definitely have to thank you for a lot because you helped me get out of my like rut of what am I going to do? Where am I going to go? Who am I going to become? And this mm -hmm. is like part of my path now, I feel like moving towards my ultimate goal. Um, yeah. Can I ask you a question about Absolutely. something you just said earlier, though? Yeah. You said that your mom always said, don't rely, don't rely, don't rely. Do you think that was motivational for you? Or do you think that was traumatizing for you? Or both? That's a really good question. My mom was really focused on not having me repeat the same cycles of um, desperation and need that she was in around money and my father and, right. and financial reliance on him. Yeah, I And don't so I her. think that it, you know, I don't think I would have pushed myself as hard in my career. Really? Um, yeah. Had I not had that in my head, just this like constant, it wasn't like a fire alarm. It was like a whisper. It was like, just don't be in a situation where you're relying on someone else. And that whisper just kept pushing me to um, just really persevere through challenges. And I don't know, I think like at the agency I was at, I got promoted like six times in two yeah. years because yeah. I was so focused on, nope, there's a certain level of financial security I want, and I don't want to rely on anyone else to give it to me. And I refuse to see the constraints in front of me as a woman and a woman of color. Like I just was like blind to it. Hell I think because my yes. mom, thanks Bean, no, because my you. mom was so right. I don't know. It didn't she feel is. scary. It felt accurate. Wow. See, you, our mindsets are just so utterly different. Totally. And yours has resulted in exactly what it is you are trying to put out there. Yeah. Well, I, mean, I think that it's not easy. So let's talk about money trauma a little bit. How about that? Okay. Okay. I didn't want to do an episode about wealth mindset and make it this toxic positivity conversation without acknowledging the massive elephant in the room, which is po poverty and Absolutely. cycles of poverty. I feel and like how, yes, I kept the saying majority like I know I'm lucky. I know I'm lucky because I want yeah. to acknowledge that as well. Yeah. The majority of the world outside of the United States, guys, lives in poverty and it is real. And so that creates cycles, generational cycles of poverty that are real. So I do want to just spend a few minutes on cycles of poverty and how they happen, right? There are a few factors here that are indisputable around poverty and <laughs> when I like read about this, it drives me crazy to g come across authors and, and thinkers and whatever who describe cycles of poverty as um, not having the desire. Oh, absolutely not. Right. 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 <laughs> because it so does not take into consideration the reality of so many oppressed people and what that is. So the first factor is just freaking inequity. Like right. we just live in societies of inequity where there is a very small portion of the population that controls the majority of the resources and the opportunity. That's just true. Correct. So if that's true, then that limits upward mobility for a large percentage of people. That is not to say it's not possible. That is not to say that because of that, we should all give up. I mean, I think that we just talked about me being a good example of choosing like to just keep pushing through it, but it doesn't mean that it's not real. And that when you have that inequity, the access you have to opportunities is much, much, much smaller. So 
I just, we need to acknowledge that. The second is there's limited access to education for many people around the world, particularly right. women and girls. And so when you don't have access to education, then your opportunities are much more limited on the other end of that. There is a lack of employment opportunities in general, um, particularly employment opportunities that pay high wages. So then that creates a reliance on low wage jobs and you have to make money to survive. So you're spending your time and energy in a highly manual, mostly right. low wage job that takes a lot of time and energy. Yeah. And you know, you go to work, you're working from whatever, 10 hours a day, you come home, it's like you have to rest. There's no hustling beyond or, that. And take care of your family and cook and Correct. clean and take care of your kids. And yeah. Yeah. Um, the other factors is just this like concept of limited social capital. You know, think about if you have privilege, who you know in your circle, of course, who you can meet, you know, like so many um, kids who get to go into colleges have who's writing their recommendation letters and who do they know inside of those schools. Right. And then when they come out of college, who do they know where they're getting the internship and all of that? So if you add all these factors of inequity, then the social capital is low, which means you're not having as many, you know, as, as much of a network that's going to support your development financially. And that is, again, real. And then lastly, like I said, this concept of intergenerational poverty. The trauma that comes with being at the poverty line, you know, not having food or clean water or access to those resources um, really does live in us and it does get passed down. And to overcome that poverty mindset, the trauma of poverty in your generational line is a huge effort because it's real. It's in your genetics that that is an actual like proof of fact. Right. Because it's happened to your ancestors. So I just wanted to say, like, we can't just have a conversation and be like, get in the wealth mindset. It's so like, just visualize it. <laughs> Where? Work, guys. Yeah. Or like, boss, bitch. No, there is so much other true, real shit layered in here that if we don't acknowledge as a society, we're not going to help uplift each other so that we can be, you know, positive and in the wealth mindset. I was going to ask, is your suggestion then a, a, a complete shift in the in the, uh, the global mindset? I mean, what what are the opportunities then for those in poverty? What are the, um, the where do they find an ability to grow and and break those cycles? I mean, I think that is such a hard question, and I don't want to be like. Yeah. Just giving work. you sweeping yeah. statements, like I just said, don't work. I mean, I think I do want to talk about how you can achieve a wealth mind wealth mindset and how I coach around money energy. Um, but I, but it is a communal effort to address these systemic issues I just mentioned. Right? right? It's yeah. it's not okay to say it is on the individual solely because so much of this is a system. That right. even if their mindset is whatever, like the system makes it really difficult. Agreed. And so I, I will say the first answer to your question is we just have to all be really honest about this and, and talk about it as proof of fact, not debate. That's what right. I think is really yeah. toxic. Like yeah. this isn't my opinion. This is right. what is happening in society. And if we can just accept that, that a very small portion of people control the majority of resources, accept it. And then move from there to, okay, so then what does equity look like in terms of opportunity and education and clean fucking water yeah. and food? Like, then maybe we can have a real conversation because we're all collectively accountable to it. So I do think it's about just acknowledging it okay. and feeling like we all need to do something about it. Absolutely. What do you think? I don't, I don't know. I don't, I mean, I can yeah. barely get my own shit together. So I certainly can't help anybody else in that department. I did have a call this week with Jen Freed and she did who tell we me had who we had podcast. on the pod. Wonderful. Yeah. Um, and she did tell me astrologically that I am very financially knowledgeable, which is a totally counter to what I have been telling myself my entire life is that I have no knowledge. Other people just handle that aspect for me. I wouldn't know what to do with it if I even tried. So wait a minute. 
What did it feel like to hear that from someone else and someone you respect? Um, jarring. It was mm. like, it was like almost as though I, I'm a brunette. It was almost as though somebody said to me, no, you are actually a blonde. You actually have blonde hair. Because mm. I didn't realize that this is such um, a, a, a deep, a deep rooted part of myself, this belief system that I cannot mm. achieve financially the way that I need, that I am incapable, um, basically, of, of creating the amount of wealth that would be necessary to maintain my lifestyle. Yes. Yeah. I'm so it was grateful that you yes. said that out loud yes. because what, what I'm hearing you say is that you identified as a yes. person who does not understand money and therefore 100%. that became your reality. And so to hear someone say that to you felt like they were giving you a different identity yes. that I'm hoping becomes really empowering for you because this is, I mean, to answer your question, I think where you were trying to go is like, well, how do we start to get into the, what stops us from being in this wealth mindset? And the first thing is your beliefs about yourself, Which right? I, like yes. when you have a belief about yourself related to money that says, I can't, I don't know it. I don't understand it. I'm not good with it. Like think about, just pause for those of you that are listening and think about for a minute, all of the stories you tell yourself about your relationship to money, all of those belief systems that we have about ourselves and how we identify with money become our reality. And the truth is, most all of them are an illusion. Most all of them have been seeds that have been planted by family members, society, culture, and they can be different if we open ourselves up to being curious about what is actually true rather than taking what we've been told. In fact, on during my session with Jen Fried, she said to me, who told you that? Like who put right. that idea in your head? And I sat and I thought like, I don't really know. I realized that this is just some culmination of all of my experiences throughout life. I never really, I never really truthfully realized, even though I've spoken it out loud to you and I've said it a million yeah. times that well, what am I going to do unless I like go back to school and become this do all this education, how will I ever make enough money? But I didn't yeah. really realize like how I've always sort of thought that about myself, even though I'm um, confident and I know that I have great abilities and I'm very capable and I'm a quick learner. I still kept, I still had it in my mind. I still have it in my mind, truthfully, that I'm just not capable, not even in a negative way. It's just kind of like something that exists in me. Like, well, you just aren't going to make enough. That's just how it is. And then that, I mean, how I agree. could that not become your reality? Totally. So I, I don't even know how to break it. I mean, I'm following a yeah. couple steps she advised, but I would love to hear what you would advise. Yeah. I mean, okay. So I will say we hit the first one, which is that our belief systems are so powerful. So the power of our consciousness, which we have covered on this podcast a yes. lot. This idea that consciousness is our ability to perceive things. And, you know, we've talked about quantum physics and the notion that as you perceive it, it becomes real. That's right. the way that physicists that study quantum physics talk about believing that it's not real until our consciousness perceives it, which right. is such a powerful notion. Really powerful That's, and scary. Right. And so money is no different. If you believe something about it, then it becomes true. So one of the things that I do a lot with clients who are struggling with this money mindset or money trauma, like I have, right. I have and deep I money have trauma. Differently. I do have it as well, but in a very different way. But I think everybody has different trauma around money. Yeah. Yeah. And mine is just to be clear, you know, watching my mom really struggle to literally just pay the mortgage and feed us. Right. We were just talking with her friend here about how when I was young, a bat flew into the house. Oh, and no. um, I was freaking out and she was like, okay, she's, she shut it in my room. She's like, come sleep in my nice. room until we figure it out. She calls an exterminator and they say it's going to cost $300. And she was telling the story about how $300 meant the electricity and the water bill that month. That's and she couldn't money. afford it. So she went that night and slept in the room, <gasps> turned the lights out with the bat to wait for it to start fluttering around and then caught it with a towel. 
Dang, Mimi. I know. She's so badass. But really? I mean, she did that out of um, necessity. necessity. Yeah. She didn't want to. So my money trauma really comes from watching that struggle happen and um, not ever feeling like I didn't have what I needed, but I knew she was really struggling to get me what I needed. But when I compared myself to my friends or I went to their homes and they had you know, the big thing was if they had a pantry full of different kinds of snacks, or I'll tell you, if they had an outside refrigerator with drinks, or if they had a drawer full of batteries, like if oh, one of my friends needed batteries and it was just there, I was like, wow, you are rich. Won't be. <laughs> but it's, it's true. true. Yeah. I bet you a lot of people will, will actually relate to that. So my money trauma is that. So what I then grew up with is there... It, there will never be enough. Like you will always be in this danger of not having enough. And um, no matter what I do and what I achieve in my career, the trauma tells me it will go away or something will happen tomorrow and all your clients will walk away and you won't have a business. And so that trauma informs Every single decision I make that isn't even related to money, it might even inform that I would let a client go over five minutes when we're done with the session time. Because the trauma when she's loud is saying, don't piss them off. Don't make them upset. You have to maintain this financial security. Now, I w practice what I preach. So I've done a lot of healing work on her right. and on that story. So mostly, thankfully, I'm not in that headspace, but it does rear up. And it, it is the reason I think so many of us find ourselves in situations where our boundaries get pushed at work or where we are. Right. I can't um, lose this job. I can't afford to not have this. I can't afford to not do this. And my yeah, trauma or, is, yeah, I was going to say, or we find ourselves in relationships and marriages where that trauma rears its head and says, you better just put up with this because, because you, need you can't exist without it. But yeah, what were you going to say? I was going to say that my trauma is different, but trauma nonetheless. And I feel like you really capitalized on your trauma and I've let my trauma completely consume me. Whereas I, my mother came from a lot of money. So she had a lot of inheritance and my parents were doctors. So they were, you know, a decent income. And, yeah. um, but still there have been a lot of, there's been a lot of financial woes in my parents' lives. Um, especially yeah. now they're not at all where I expected things to be, you know, given the history. And so in my mind, I think, wow, it doesn't really matter. Like you can come from it. You can make it. Mm. It doesn't really matter. You know, it's, if you don't, aren't super smart about it and save really well, um, mm. then you're screwed. So right. what, what's the point? And instead of using it to motivate me, like you did, I feel like I use it to cower and I don't mm. want to do it anymore, but I don't know how to break out of it. But I will say that the awareness of the trauma and the desire for something different are the two most important ingredients to transforming it. Great. I got it. Whereas I think that before you didn't have the awareness of the trauma and the desire didn't exist. And I'm just telling you those two things, that's all you need. You just need to know where it's blocking you and have a different desire. Okay. And so yeah. that will move you forward. So, okay, so let's just go back to Yeah. That, that, yeah I'm in that right now. I'm in that. You're in that. Yeah. But and you I'm have to trust still... that. I do. But you have to trust. Yeah. You just have to trust being in that because okay. then new okay. opportunities will come up to you from that place in your mind that you would have been blind to before. Um, when we talk about the power of consciousness around money, um, there's a few things you can do to actually explore this right now. Oh. And when I say that there are belief systems we have, Get really curious with yourself about what you believe about money. Um, you know, one, like we just talked about, what money beliefs have been handed down to you? What did you watch your family do that instilled in you a belief about money? Remembering that just because that was their reality doesn't mean it's yours because right. they are different people with different capabilities, with different traumas and limiting beliefs than you have. Correct. So yes, you watched it happen, but you don't have to make the sequel. The second thing you can do is get curious about judgments you have about money. We look at people with money and we have judgments. Do we think that they're soulless? Do we think that they're fake? Do we think that, do you see what I mean? Like sometimes we have, we want the wealth, but we judge the wealth in a very negative way. 
we we create these mean labels for people who are wealthy. Now, I will say sometimes they behave in a way right. that makes us accurately assess their character. So yes, fair, but don't judge the money. Does that make right. sense? Like judge the person and their actions. Well, don't judge the person either. But if you feel like their character <laughs> is something that if it's your if their character isn't something that you want to align to, sure. But don't judge the having of the money. Because if everything is consciousness, remember that you are creating a block in your consciousness about money when you have that negative impression of wealth in your own mind. So um, you're saying money is neither, it, there is no, it's not positive or negative. It just is. It's what people do that, with money and their actions around money that are the issue. That is such a great point because we didn't say this yet. And I say it all the time. Money is just energy. I know it sounds woo-woo because it's a tangible paper or coin, but it comes and it is attracted to an energy that likes it or that is aligned to its frequency. It is a neutral energy. Money doesn't have a negative side or the, the actual money. I'm not saying right. what people do with wealth, but right. actual money. It doesn't have a positive or a negative ion. It just is an energy. And so when you align to its frequency, then it can come to you more easily than if you are misaligned with its frequency because of these judgments you have about it or your relationship to it. Okay. Again, that's, I think you're referencing, I think that can get woo-woo for people. Like you just said, I think you're really referencing that you're not the money comes to you when you're aligned with it, but if you can um, kind of dig through your limiting beliefs about money, you can enter a headspace where you become more receptive. Thank you. Exactly. Okay. Yeah. Um, I'm all okay. into the woo-woo energy, by the way, but I just feel like all listeners may be like, what if I just like am into the energy levels yeah. and it's just going to magnetize to my body? Yeah. No, I'm so glad you said it that way because that's the most practical way to think about it. Yeah. Um, the other judgments about money that you'll find are, again, what do you believe about yourself in relation to money? I talked about this up top. I'm not good with it. Um, I don't deserve it. Uh, no one ever had it, so I can't have it. Or I don't know how to save or whatever it is. Like, Get really just honest with yourself about what you believe about yourself and your worth related to money. And then one thing that we talked about, we talked about Ainsley on this podcast, who yes. I love and made such an impact on me and my method. But I, when I, in my reading with Ainsley, Ainsley said that I have a past life fear of money that is really present right now. And it comes from, you know, lifetimes of poverty mm -hmm. and that what I, when you have a fear of money, which couldn't be so more true, you want to get rid of it. You don't want to save it or hold it. And so Why? my behavior, because you're afraid of it. Oh, like actually you're, you actually fear the money itself. You just, you have this mindset. It's a super subconscious mindset of right? not being comfortable with it, having a fear of it. And so it's what was accurate is that I used to just spend without any thought. I, I remember. I mean, <laughs> it's fun, right? Yes. It was the best times, honestly. <laughs> yeah. And it can be so extravagant. And by the way, I manifested situations where like I was spending on someone else's dime. Like so much of what I did on the agency was to go entertain clients and the agency would pay for it. But like there was, you know, <laughs> no expense was spared when I was in control of the credit totally. card. So I do have this like spend, 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 spend because of this fear that it won't stay. So I need to quickly make the most of this experience right now and go do the extravagant thing because it's not long lasting. Then how do you explain my mindset, which is I really want to save, but I just keep spending, spending, spending. I, that doesn't even make sense. I don't know. I know. That's what I'm saying. The whole thing's very confusing. And you might, I, I have a very, I feel like I'm, we've discussed also that I'm a pretty confident person and I have a lot of faith in myself and my abilities. Yet I, I'm totally not, I have no faith in my ability to make money. It's so yeah. bizarre. It's so not aligned with the rest of me. Well, but we just talked about why you don't have your faith yeah. in your ability to make money, which is all of that stuff from the past. 
Um, I don't know. I actually think that if you really want to save, but you spend, 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 you might have a similar thing where there's like a fear of not having it. So you need to like have the stuff now. Oh. I don't know. Think about it. We don't have to solve it. Today. All right. I will. Um, so anyway, so belief, power of consciousness is the first thing is just examine your beliefs around money and, and just understand that they were implanted into you. They aren't a reality. They're just a perception that was implanted into you or a previous generation's reality that very much gets hand, handed down. I actually, one thing that I thought was really cool, we talk about generational trauma a lot. And I found this study that says, um, a growing body of researchers believe that trauma can leave a lasting chemical mark on a person's genes. In recent years, the evolving study of epigenetics has revealed that the traumas of our ancestors not only impacted their gene expression, but can uh, also be carried through generations. Traumas wow. that we do not even know about that our grandparents experienced before they had children can uh, influence their own fears. So your relationship with money can really be determined by this chemical marker that your ancestors That's really wild. And I just thought of something else that um, I did read a while ago, but I I don't know if it's accurate, but it sounds like it might be accurate um, that children of immigrants tend to work really hard and be more successful. I think because they often watch their parents suffer um, in an attempt right. to assimilate. So they are like, never, not me, not me, not me. And they all work right. really hard and they become successful. Yeah. And immigrant parents having had one right. um, really do not allow you to just rest on your laurels. Like they really are pushing you to constantly be working hard right. because they don't want you to suffer the way they suffered when they had to start over again and build right. a life somewhere that makes else. Makes sense. Okay, so that's one thing you can do okay. is understand the power of your consciousness. The second thing is going to strike you as woo-woo, but the power of visualization. So just spending a minute or two every day closing your eyes and visualizing what would it be right now if I had all the things that I desired? What house, what does the house feel like? What does it feel like to be walking through this house? What does it feel like to be whatever, wearing that designer dress and going to that dinner? What does it feel like on me? Because it influences the power of your consciousness. It changes your frequency even for 60 seconds to that frequency of the thing you desire. That's what visualization does. Interesting. Um, the third thing I talk about, not just with money, with everything is, you have to have faith in the things you can't see. And in my work, it is your higher self. So if we're thinking about higher self and money, if you have faith in this dignified, empowered, wise, divine aspect of yourself that can do anything that is constantly guiding you towards all of your desires and your highest good. That looks like not constantly needing evidence every day. It looks like being able to be centered in, you know what? I just trust. And this trust itself will produce the thing that I'm looking for. And I can tell you, I have moved from fear of losing contracts and clients um, to now, truly, I can say this, having sometimes just to, for context, I do coach individuals, right? Most mm -hmm. of those are creatives and performers, but I do have these agreements where I'm a coach in residence for usually mid-sized companies helping the founders and their leaders. And those are my larger engagements. Sometimes we'll run, it'll run its course. Of course, there's right. one right now where I've been coaching them for three years. It runs its course and it is coming to an end. And I was really surprised at myself when this happened recently, where three or four years ago, I would have been in full panic mode, full panic mode, right? Trust and faith looks for me like, oh, I see you're removing this higher self because something better is coming because every single time those contracts have ended, something better has come every time. Like I have evidence and to help the part of me that's traumatized, that little girl, I write it down when it happens. So I can go back and look at it when she gets scared and say, Hey, remember when this client went away? Did you remember these other three came and you loved that work? Remember when this went away? Did you remember you got your book deal that month? Like really trying to just remind myself 
that I have to have trust and faith because in the past it has worked that way. I guess that's my issue is that I lack that trust. And I have always struggled even being your friend and working alongside of you and hearing your tips to have faith in what cannot be seen. Yeah. It's really hard. It is really hard, but you know what? You said this once on a, I don't remember what episode, but you were like, why not? Why not? Which was kind of my mentality last year. I feel like I'm kind of getting back into a, because it's scary box. Contracted state. I am getting back into a contracted state. I feel like a little bit, I think because I'm feeling stuck again. And there was so much momentum last year that I kept being like, why not? Why not? Why not? I'm seeing all this stuff. And then I don't know what happened, but something made me freeze recently. And now again, I feel stuck. Whereas last year I kept feeling um, that growth. I kept feeling a lot of growth yeah. and it was really healthy and it was really motivational for me. And then I don't know, I th- I do know actually, I, I just discussed it with the producer right before. I'm trying to learn how to manage working and still being a mom and taking care of yeah. the house. And I feel like I'm not doing any of those well and I'm just sort of learning how to do it. And it's making me feel like I'm not um, successful right now in any particular area. Yeah. So I'm and I want to remind you, right. But I want to remind you of something. Healing is not linear. Right. So right. you are back to the very thing you're trying to heal, but at a higher level, right. at a different frequency, you've already accomplished more than you did last year. Yes. And now you're healing that thing again. And a contraction is what happens before birth. Ooh, well so remember said. that when you're in a contraction, something is coming from that contraction. Okay. And okay. just even having faith in the contraction itself okay. is really important. All right. The contraction feels very scary. And just like birth, yeah. it feels it's very overwhelming when you're having contraction during birth. Yes. Yes. You exactly. almost feel like jumping out of your skin, which is kind of how I feel right now. Well, then so, remember all you have evidence, literally, evidence. of what comes from yes. a contraction. Yes. Those beautiful children. And what comes of releasing. Right. Like last year was beautiful. There was so much growth. Right. Okay. Um, I'm going to get through the last few because I want to make sure our listeners have their guidebook to an actually organic wealth mindset, not a toxic alpha positivity one. Um, The other ones are just quickly, just, you know, you have these desires within you, honor them. Don't judge them. Align your belief system to the desires you have, which means if I want to, you know, have this glowing career and live in this massive home, that's okay. There's nothing shameful about it. I believe positively about that desire. And we just, I know it sounds easy, but we just have been really taught to feel shame over our desires. Right. And that's not going to align to attracting the thing you want to you. Like, why are you happy with what you have kind of vibe? Yeah, right. Right. Um, I know that this one's hard and I get annoyed when I hear it too, especially when life is hard. Yeah. But there's so much to be said for gratitude and presence and joy in the present moment. Right. Like, I'm not saying when you can't afford groceries, (laughs) you need to be walking around grateful all the time. I'm not saying that. But I am saying things that I learned from my own grandmother who grew up in rural Iran with very little resource, she would find joy in the teeniest, tiniest things. Like, oh my God, look at how this flower is blooming right now when it's 50 degrees out. And she would just be so present in that moment. She also had so much gratitude. She would walk around just saying, thank you, God, constantly for everything. And I've learned that from her so that when I go to the grocery store, I think I've said this, every time I go to the grocery store and the cart is full and I'm able to check out without worrying about it, I say thank you. That attitude of gratitude, (laughs) bars, um, does not, it is only um, expansive. It's an expansion energy. Like gratitude just expands upon itself. So I'm not taking away the difficulty of life. I'm just saying in those little moments, that gratitude just, it, it compounds upon itself. I mean, that works in all areas, not just money. Totally. You're saying that to apply it also financially. Yeah. Um, and then of course, lastly, there's, there's persistence. You just, you have to believe in yourself and you can't give up. And I mean, take it from me. 
I've had so many examples of people, mostly men, white men, <laughs> telling me, no, you can't. No, you shouldn't. Too aggressive. Don't say it that way. Don't do it that way. Fuck you, that. I know. And you've never, li- you've never cared. You've never listened. It's so- It's not that I don't care. It's just yes, that I believe right. in myself and what yes. I want more than I believe in their desire to hold me down. And so you, you should. just have to persist. You have to persist through it. Okay. I'm shifting okay. this shit now. You promise? Yeah. <laughs> no, I don't. I mean, I'm trying. <sighs> Yeah. I mean, listen, I also just, I don't want to end this episode without talking about just some of the pitfalls of over focus on money and right. obsession with money because we live in such a capitalistic culture that values materialism so much more than the quality of your inner life. And I do want to say that's not what we're advocating no. for whatsoever because, you know, there's so many, I mean, I work with lots of wealthy people. They're not as happy as you think they are. Right. Um, because the inner life doesn't feel good or the relationships don't feel connected. So I will just say this hustle culture and our over obsession with materialism um, is leading us to be disconnected from each other and from ourselves. And we need community to feel healthy and good. It's actually one of our b- human needs is belonging. We need to focus on valuing time over money. Like, what time feels like when you have freedom, when you're able to just spend time with the people you love, doing the things you love, that is so much more valuable than getting the thing that you want. Right. And we have to value our health over money. Because again, as my grandmother used to always say, you could have millions of dollars, but if you can't enjoy it because you're laying in bed ill, then it's never, ever, ever worth it. And I think our hustle culture is so dangerous around sacrificing your own well-being and health just to get the thing. So I'm asking for like a masterclass here from all of you, which is a balance right. of yeah. like really <laughs> wanting the desire, believing in yourself, but not losing all the things that matter in this precious life we have. In just pursuit. to achieve. Right. I get yeah. it. I was going to say, so your takeaway is go for it, but don't go for it. But don't go for it. <laughs> but now I hear what you're saying, which is go for it, but keep it in perspective while you're right. going for it. Right. All right. Melissa's famous takeaway. Drum roll. That was my, wait, I just oh, did it. That was that it. Was my, you can't take my takeaway and say no, it's my your take- takeaway. But my takeaway is always kind of a summarization of what you've shared over the episode. And but I want to know what sticks out to you the most. Our listeners need to know what Melissa sticks out Gushka. to me the most. What I think sticks it's out the, to you? I think a lot of it is about the mindset, um, not even necessarily your skills and your abilities. Thinking, well, I can't make money because I, I I can't be a doctor or I can't be this because I don't have the ability. But you could achieve it in a different way, perhaps if you shift your mindset. And again, I'm in the middle of this, and it's. I don't know where it's taking me, but I understand how challenging it is, especially after a lifetime of and potentially uh, it being in your genetics to feel this way, how hard it is to break out of it. Absolutely. Well, Beanie, Beam. I loved talking to you about this. I think it was super cathartic for both of us because we definitely both have this money trauma. So yeah, I'm so happy to be in this boat with you. Me too. This weird money trauma boat. This weird money boat. <laughs> All right. Well, I will see you next week. Before we let you go, listeners, uh, thank you for listening. If you want to support the show, we would so appreciate sharing this show with your friends, with people who you think will relate or need this kind of personal growth and healing. And then as always, if you could leave us a review, we would extra appreciate that. We love and appreciate all of you so much. We'll see you next week. Love you. Bye. Bye.